just like to say thank you all for joining us on this uh, webinar with the International Society for Quality of Life Studies in conjunction with the Happiness Alliance. My name is Jill Johnson. I'm the Executive Director for ISQALS. And uh, you can see also in your screen, Laura Muzikanski, who is the Director for Happiness Alliance. And together we um, seek out uh, professionals to present these wonderful webinars. And we're so grateful to have Beth Allgood with us today to present her webinar. I'm gonna turn it over to Laura uh, and she'll give a little introduction to our speaker. Great, thank you, Jill. So Beth will be at the ISQALS conference with Mark as well as Rhonda and Eric to present uh, a panel about this work. Wow. Beth Allgood, we're so pleased to have her as our guest for this webinar for ISQALS and the Happiness Alliance, and I'll read her bio. She is the country director for IFA, the International Fund for Animal Welfare. Beth assures the strategic development and implementation of US projects, campaigns, and advocacy. She also leads IFA's innovative work to look beyond GDP for alternatives that better promote happiness and well-being for people, animals, and the planet. Beth has presented on the link between animals and human well-being in the halls of US Congress and at the Convention on Biodiversity and other conferences and venues in Washington, DC, and around the world. She's been quoted on Wales in the Washington Post, on wildlife crime in USA Today, and has appeared on CNN in the Boston Globe and among other media outlets. Well, before I start, I'll just tell you a little bit about IFA. We were started 50 years ago to save one species, the, uh, the seal, from the seal hunt. And in the last 50 years, we've worked on a lot of issues and we're really focused on people and animals thriving together, which is really the core of this work. And we believe that every individual animal matters. And so the work that we do focuses on individual animals, populations, and species. And of course, the habitat where they live and that we all live on this, this planet. And so the work that we're going to talk about today is really about the connection between all of the all of that, the people, the animals, and the planet. And it's really critical to IFA's work. Before I get started, I would like everyone, I invite you to close your eyes for just a second and think about a time when an encounter with an animal made you happy. Um, okay, so if you've got something in your mind, um, all right, I'm having a little trouble. I can't get to the next step. Um, it's completely not working. Hold on one second. Oh, there we go. Okay. So maybe, what? Okay. Maybe you, th you can open your eyes. <laughs> Sorry. Maybe you thought about um, a cat or a dog or wildlife or a songbird outside your window. And now I'm gonna ask you to imagine how the current system that we're in, the current system that's really driven by um, short-term economic growth, um, supports that happy experience. Well, it probably, depending on what you thought of, but it probably doesn't. Um, our system values short-term economic activity as measured by gross domestic product or GDP over pretty much any other value. And in the animal examples here on the screen, it favors time at work over time that you would spend with your companion animal. It values developed land over wide open spaces with wildlife and wild places. And it values trees sold as lumber over a place for birds to sing, for example. Um, so it supports short-term productivity over general well-being, certainly. And a company that did that wouldn't stay in business very long. And a, a government that does that isn't really looking out for the best interest of, of everybody in that country. And it's wreaking havoc on our planet. So this is an image of 
some um, rescuers after Hurricane Katrina. And Hurricane Katrina and other natural disasters are actually really great for GDP. They boost it. The recovery efforts are expensive and all of that, all of that is actually really terrific for the economy. But nobody would argue that it increases our well-being. The same is true for crime, the same is true for war. Um, it boosts GDP, but it really decreases well-being. So why do we do this work? We at IFA have been working on linking with animals and human well-being for many, many years. And I've been working in Washington for over 20 years, trying to save wildlife, habitat, improve animal welfare. And sometimes it works. Sometimes you get policies that protect a species or save a protected area or something like that. Um, but with pressure like our current system is exerting, there's always another development. There's always another animal wildlife product to take the place of the one that you've just, you know, got some protection for. As long as we value the short-term productivity over everything else, that's going to be the case. So when I saw this Hurricane Katrina example, that it had a positive impact on GDP, but it devastated the environment and caused this terrible suffering and how crime and war can do the same thing, I thought, we must be measuring something wrong if things that grow are always considered good when they just aren't. <laughs> so um, when the growth was also growing consumption in illegal wildlife, for example, and growing climate change, I thought maybe we could apply something like what they have in Bhutan with gross national happiness to good animal welfare and conservation and the threats facing animals. And, and maybe we could start thinking about just completely changing the system instead of always trying to work around the edges of a system that doesn't work. So for example, when we make rhino horn illegal, people move to ivory. Um, there's always another species when we value the trinkets that animals can the parts of animals can make over the lives of the animals. So we should absolutely promote growth, but we should define growth as growing the things that matter, not just growing the money short-term economy. So that's kind of how this all generated. And I think that there's a number of reasons why this work is really important right now. I think there's a, some societal shifts that are happening that make this the best time to do this work. You know, they always say that the best time to do it was 20 years ago, but the second best time is right now. So I think there's a really great, a couple really great reasons why now is the time. The sixth extinction crisis is happening right now. It makes it urgent to address these threats. And news comes out almost daily about new species being at the tipping point. And of course, <laughs> um, there was this recent UN report showing how many species are on the brink of extinction. And it's just so shocking that it really got people's attention. Um, and it's based in, in science. It's not just, you know, um, alarming news that people make up. I mean, it's a huge scientific study that showed that. Corporations in most sectors have started to measure what they call the triple bottom line. Um, B Corp certification is well recognized and consumers are really demanding ethical behavior from their companies. Companies are responding with long range planning that considers social, environmental, and broad based economic values, meaning not just short term economic, but long term inclusive economic values. And um, so the best companies are actually showing they need to be responsive and responsible companies in order to have a long term um, viability. For their own for their own companies and we can learn from them and see what we can apply to policies um, for for governments as well also people's interest in happiness personal happiness and well-being is growing exponentially and we know that animals and nature make people happy 
we have a lot of research to back that up, which I'll go into in a little bit. Um, so it's a, it's kind of a, it's a pivotal part of that personal happiness movement. In fact, we commissioned a poll, um, IFA did, with an independent pollster, and we got the results back a few weeks ago. 94% of the people polled felt that being around pets contributed to an individual's happiness. 88% of voters said the ability to view wildlife in their native habitats contributed to an individual's happiness. These are outstanding numbers. People, getting 90% of people to agree on anything in this country is just, it's amazing. <laughs> and so um, we think that's, that's um, pretty amazing. Also, another societal factor that we think is, is um, showing that this work is, is, is important now, the global conversation has acknowledged that GDP is an incomplete metric and that the drive to increase GDP at all costs is just bad for people and the planet. It's starting to get traction as a message. Um, there will be a need to replace this, but with what? is the question and we want to make sure that animals are part of that conversation. There's a global call to measure national well-being instead of just GDP and countries are answering that call. So Bhutan was first with the gross national happiness, but the United Arab Emirates has a happiness ministry. New Zealand has recently started reporting on its national budget and how it affects happiness. And there's a call for an alternative to the G8 that would be something like the um, Well-Being 7 or something like that. So um, there are lots of countries that are doing really interesting things in this space. Not the U.S. yet, but, you know, we're <laughs> the, the, the story's not over. So um, in this policy conversation, we have to show how animals contribute to human well-being. So that's the kind of the core of this work, that when... When the world is ready to change, which we're pushing, we need to be able to have the, the data necessary to, to show how animals contribute. And that includes things like planning for disasters. Animals contribute to human well being in lots of ways. Um, people care about their animals in disasters, and we need to plan for them for animals in disasters. We need to fund habitat protection, we need to have endangered species protection. We need to have animals in development planning in general. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but better conservation and animal welfare aren't just luxuries for animals, they are vital for people. And we need to demonstrate how to do that for international policymakers and for governments and give them a blueprint on how to do that. So that's one of the things we're working on. And then the other thing in parallel is working with communities because communities are critical for conservation. That's where the rubber meets the road in terms of um, living with animals. And they have to, these communities have to be included in conservation plans. And recent research, not ours, but this is research that's available out there, demonstrates that while the world's 370 million indigenous people make up less than 5% of the total human population, they manage or hold tenure over 25% of the world's land surface and support 80% of global biodiversity. So these communities are living with wildlife successfully and they're the solution to the crisis and they have to be included in any successful conservation planning and implementation. So we have to figure out what they're doing right and what we can learn and implement from them. So, we are trying to study what these communities and other communities are doing well and develop a tool to try to get consistent results for communities um, pro projects in the field. So I'm going to just go into a little bit more detail on both the policy and the project side um, and what we're doing, um, but just quickly a little more about the background um, with something that I've been working on for years, which is Elephants, so many of you may know that we are we're losing elephants. Elephants are being poached more than one every 30 minutes. It's taken by poachers. 
more are being killed than are born every year. And this crisis has some impact on you know, productivity or GDP, like reducing the value of ecotourism in countries where people go to visit them. But most of the value of elephants is beyond money. They contribute to the ecosystem, they disperse seeds, they dig water holes, they add important tangible value to other animals, to people. But they have other values that, that, that aren't measured in monetary ways. They have spiritual, they have cultural, and they have an intrinsic value. If people weren't around, they would still have a value. Just being an elephant is a value. People love seeing elephants and just knowing they're there. Even if you don't go to Africa to see them, you know that they're there and that's a, that's a value. And if we lost elephants, we would lose a lot more than money could measure. Our system values economic productivity over all other values and it's fueled ivory poaching and trafficking in other elephant products because those products are worth more than an elephant, a live elephant in the wild. And the same is true of you know, rhinos, um, tigers, any other kind of wildlife trade or trafficking that goes on. And so this is one of the issues that I think underpins um, this, this whole body of work for me. It's how I got into it in the first place. Um, and so that's how we, the, the initial project was uh, measuring what matters. We did a report which basically looked at how animals contribute to human well being as a way to convince policymakers who care about people that animals are important to people. Now, lots of people care about animals anyway, and they don't need this report. You don't have to show them that, that animals are important. They already know, but this is for policymakers who care about people to show that animals matter. What we did, we, we did a survey of a bunch of different um, well being indicator systems, but we picked gross national happiness from Bhutan, which has um, a they have living standards, as you can see, which is broader than just GDP, but it is an economic value, and then they have all these other values you can see on the screen health, education, cultural diversity, governance, community vitality, et cetera, including, of course, economic diversity and resilience, I mean, ecological diversity and resilience. And they value them, they measure them, and then they make decisions using them all equally. That's the theory behind having this kind of broad indicator system. And then we looked at how animals contribute to all of these things, and that Safeguarding the welfare of animals leads to positive human outcomes. So some examples include that companion animals contribute to physical and mental health. Healthy farm animals are linked to higher productivity and quality. And nature and wildlife strengthen the vitality and resilience of communities. Um, I'm just going to ask anyone who's not muted to go ahead and mute because there's some feedback. Like that. Thank you. So if you're, if you're not muted, if you could do so, that'd be great. Thanks. Um, okay, so that was great as a first step, and we got a lot of traction, actually. Um, we did case studies from different um, countries, from different, uh, different nonprofits that are working in the field to show examples of that. So, and we, we reviewed literature from all kinds of different, um, different types of studies that were, that were done linking um, linking animals to human well-being. And then we have moved on to some different work because not everyone thinks as broadly as Bhutan in terms of well-being, but the UN development goals are, are much more mainstream right now in, uh, in the world. And people, everyone is, is contributing towards measuring UN development goals, except for the US at the moment. But Every, all, every other country is measuring their contribution towards the UN um, SDGs. And so we wanted to look at how conservation, animal welfare, and human well being are interwoven and how they really, for the achievement of the sustainable development goals, they have to be looked at together. 
And we found, and we gave case studies again, and we basically, it's not too surprising, but we found that animals are a valuable tool to improve all of the, S, almost all of the SDGs. There are some that aren't too relevant, but almost all of them are. And that effective animal welfare and conservation can contribute significantly to achieving them. So when animals and habitats are cared for, everyone benefits. And you can really take it a step further and say that when animals aren't considered, people on the planet will suffer. So there are two conservation specific goals, life on land and life below water. But even in the ones that aren't conservation or animal specific, there is a link. So for example, 1.6 billion people depend on forests for jobs, livelihoods, food, and fuel. One out of eight people depend on fisheries for their livelihoods. And more than 4 billion people depend on medicines from forests for their health. So we think it's really vital to extend the conversation from on human health to where are the intersections with animals, animal welfare, wild animals, diseases, you know, that there are, we have to have that conversation and a lot of countries really are focused on uh, animals in the conservation goals and not on the other ones. So this is something that we're working on. Our next steps on that body of work are to try to, to create a blueprint that we, we want to um, talk to countries about, about um, how, to, how to better incorporate animals into their development and into their sustainable goals, sustainable development goals specifically. Okay, and then the other set of work, well, I'll just go in um, quickly, is, so a lot of conservation projects involve basically paying communities to live with wildlife. I mean, it's, it's simple <laughs> and, um, but there's a lot of conflict with wildlife in, in communities. Um, elephants raid crops, you know, um, wolves are scary and eat livestock. I mean, there, there's a lot of things that um, on the surface seem um, contentious. Um, and, and an easy solution might be to pay communities to just leave the wildlife alone. There are problems with that, which are conservation organizations don't always have enough money to stay in a community to pay them to love wildlife by building a school or something like that. And it doesn't actually change, even if you can work on the conflict situation at the same time. If they don't actually want to live in their community and appreciate the wildlife, if someone else comes around with more money to pay them to build a shopping mall and, um, you know, kill the wildlife. If you haven't actually changed the situation on the ground for the community, then it, uh, if it's a money, if it's if it's a situation of giving them money and someone else has more money, then that will win. What we want to look at is how can what is it about a community that makes people want to live in it, and how can you tie that to the conservation right outside the community? So. We have, um, we did a, a lot of research and we wrote a paper about using the community well-being domains, the broad-based community well-being domains, and improving them so that people actually um, really felt satisfied with their life, their happiness, and their well-being in the community, and tying it with the conservation and wildlife so that they saw the connection to how their community was linked to wildlife. Basically. And um, we looked at nine projects around the world that different nonprofits were doing that were successful in their conservation benefits and looked at how they had improved the different community well being domains to get there. And um, we found we had some really interesting findings, um, which we presented last summer at several different conferences and it will be coming out in a journal um, soon. And the basic takeaway is we wanted to describe the common factors and why these projects were working and develop a tool to replicate these factors so that we could create more successful projects 
effectively and efficiently because one thing the conservation community doesn't have is endless amounts of money to try and fail in the same ways over and over again. It's okay if you fail and learn, but to make the same mistakes over and over again is, is not helpful in the time that we have with this extinction crisis. <laughs> so we are, our next steps with that work is to develop, we're working on a survey tool now with Laura and um, it will have indicator, well-being indicators and um, some community indicators and it'll be linked to a community driven process that we hope to use to, to, to be able to design interventions that make the most sense um, in that community with the wildlife around that community that we'll test, we'll, we'll, we're designing the tool, we're gonna present it at ISPALS in September and then after that we'll be testing it and developing the, the process that we'll use to actually um, decide on the projects and then we'll, we'll, we'll test all of that in the future. But um, it's pretty exciting and um, I'm happy to answer some questions about it um, and we can, we can talk more about that. So basically the upshot of all of that is we're working to get countries and policymakers to think about animals and wildlife in their policies and then we're really hoping to be able to get communities um, to better live with wildlife through this, these types of tools that are, um, that are systematic so that it's not as much of a um, trial and error process, but that we can take the lessons that we've learned over so many years of conservation and, and really um, try to streamline them because of, of the the, the fact is that time is running out to save animals and, and we want to, to make these processes as effective as we can. So I guess I'm gonna end there because we'd love your thoughts and your feedback about what's going on and, um, and just have some questions and some, some conversation. While, while we're waiting, please do unmute yourself and then ask questions. So I'll ask, I'll ask Beth. And Mark, would you tell us your vision of a, a really um, successful project of using a beyond GDP measure where community-based cons cons uh, conservation is sustainable and effective? What would that look like to you? Um, well, that's a great question. And um, IFA has a lot of examples in the field about, um, you know, successful projects where the community is really linked with wildlife conservation. But since all the work that we've talked about so far is about the research IFO's doing and the type of work that IFO's doing, um, I can give a, a, an example of another organization that we looked at for the paper that we did, which is Health and Harmony and the kind of work that they did. Okay, some, some of the ones that we looked at from our last paper were really inspirational to us. And, you know, some of them were IFA and some of them weren't. But um, the thing that amazes me about some of these projects is that they, they happen in the face of the system, which I think is really stacked against most successful projects, right? But... Um, one that I absolutely love is in, um, in Borneo, and it's Health and Harmony is the organization that implements it. And um, it started with the, the person who runs the program going out to this community which had problems with illegal logging and um, orangutans were being um, killed through the process of illegal logging. And she went out to find out what was going on and she had um, a thousand hours that she just listened to the community to find out what the situation was, what's going on, and why people were logging. And there were two main reasons, or why they were cutting down the trees, basically. I mean, it was logging, but um, one of, part of it was for agriculture, for um, agriculture because the only kind of agriculture they knew was um, slash and burn. And it had worked for a long time, but with the with the pressures of population and all of that, it was becoming, it was just becoming unsustainable. And the other reason was to, they would cut down big trees when they needed to pay for healthcare and um, an emergency healthcare situations. You know, there were 
lives were dying in childbirth and this kind of thing. And so by figuring out how you could address those two main issues and doing some other things around it, they basically solved the problem. You know, they set up kind of a barter healthcare system. They trained local um, people for, they brought in doctors. It, it was a kind of a complicated um, situation, but it wasn't, it wasn't hard. It just, they needed to address the root causes. And then they brought in people from a, a neighboring community to talk, to, to do sustainable agriculture, um, organic sustainable agriculture. And um, they haven't, had any illegal logging in the community and the community is very vigilant about not allowing others to come in and so they basically solved the problem and it involved a lot of the domains that we looked at you know it involved connecting health and education and agriculture and livelihoods and um and to me that was just um but it, it fundamentally came from understanding what the drivers in the community were to the problem with wildlife. They had no problem with orangutans in this community. They, they, didn't, they liked them, you know, it wasn't like it was a conflict with them, but they were just an unfortunate um, victim of these other broader issues that were impacting the community. I think the key here is that, you know, a solution that could have been done is paying the farmers, you know, dollars, to not log and to, to try to switch to uh, more sustainable farming techniques. However, how sustainable is that? Not very, because once the funding runs out, then you, you run out. So they are able to increase the capacity of the community, so they're training people. Um, and they also, they also talked to them and spoke to them and, and work with them in their own language and their own way. So. Something that always that caught my eye originally with this project was that they provide healthcare with bartering, which is the traditional way of acquiring goods and services in, the, in that area, instead of them having to learn how to use money that they're not familiar with. Or find ways to make money. Right. And they can just give them a chicken, you yeah. know, and then it, it's just really. And then with the sustainable farming techniques, they said they had, a, was it another? Island. Mm -hmm. yeah, they had people come from another island, so different cultures, but a little, a little. It wasn't, you know, a PowerPoint presentation. It was yeah. very hands-on learning and capacity building, not just here's a, you know, here's a couple tools. Here's how you do it. Go do it. Um, so they really created an environment for success. And to answer your question, Laura, that's kind of what we're getting at. Um, is a vision where people, conservation practitioners, are understanding the needs and the intricacies in, the, in each community that they're working in and crafting solutions that work for everybody. Yeah, one of the things that we're hoping to do with this new paper that we're working on is what we learned from the first paper was that people in the community really have to um, embrace and um, and really identify the solutions that work for them. The one issue with that is that they don't have the, the one thing that external people have is the context of what's going on in the rest of the world to compare it to and the, the kind of, um, the, they know what's worked in other places. They have this kind of universe of experience, right? And so you have to find a way to marry the two but not have these solutions that come from outside that are imposed. So you need, you need the, the expertise and the creativity and the knowledge of what's worked other places and what's even possible other places. But then you need the context from the community to say, but this is what we want and this is what we, given all of that, this is what we think would work here and these are our priorities. So what we were, what we're hoping to do with this, this paper that you know, we're working on together is find some way to, to kind of benchmark this community's well-being against the rest of the world through these questions that are comparable, the data is comparable with the rest of the world's data to see how they, how they rank with everybody else, but then ask a little more culturally relevant questions about 
how they feel about those things and what they want to do about those things so that you're not looking at a top-down solution or a bottom-up solution, but a good marriage of the two that's culturally relevant, but ground truth against kind of what's possible in the world. But I was just curious to know, Beth, if the project you were talking about in Borneo has been uh, used as a model for similar projects elsewhere in the area, or is it just this one community? Because of course, you want to be able to take those successes and replicate them as, in as many places as possible that they're relevant. Um, yes, yeah, so they have used the, that as a model for some other projects, um, I think in, in even vastly different places, but they, they've used their radical listening, they call it, and, and some other, I mean, the, the model, I think the part that they can use as a model is going into the community and, and radically listening to their issues. But of course, the issues might be very different in other communities. So um, the, they, have, they have used similar strategies. I don't know that the solutions have always been the same. And that's the only, um, that's the only project of theirs that we analyzed in depth. Um, and so I'm not sure entirely uh, what else they've done. I know that they have projects now, I think in five or six countries. Um, and I think they, they vary slightly depending on what the community has asked or has, has evaluated to be their, the drivers of their, of their issues. But they are, um, they're an amazing organization and I really highly recommend checking them out, Help and Harmony. I will say IFA has also had great success. <laughs> so in, in this kind of model that what we've done in, um, in Malawi, we also analyzed that project um, and we had, you know, we've done really great things there. We've, we've, um, we analyzed these nine projects and we're going to be, um, I'm not sure when this paper is going to be published, but it's, it's submitted to the, to the journal and, and we're just waiting to find out, you know, when it'll come out. But all of the projects that we looked at, we chose them because they had really good wildlife outcomes and we knew that they had worked well with the community. So specifically what we did was we evaluated which community well-being domains they planned to work on. And then we also looked at which community well-being domains just happened to be improved while during the project, whether they had planned to do it or not. And it was really interesting because all nine well-being domains were used in at least one project. Um, and some were used in many. So um, but it, was, it was a kind of a cool um, result, we thought. <laughs> Beautiful. Anybody else have questions? Um, Beth, do you have a slide with your contact information so people can get in touch with you? Um, I think I do. Yes, beautiful. Oh. <laughs> All right, good. So you can get in touch with Beth and this presentation has been recorded. So we will try to get it up today or tomorrow. And then, uh, Jill, you'll send out the link for the recording, right? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Beth uh, and Mark, for the great presentation. We really appreciated it. And uh, especially, as I mentioned last time, this has, is sort of a topic that is undiscovered uh, within particularly ISQAL, so it's nice to have your representation, and we're so pleased that you're going to be attending the conference. And for those of you, this is just a little plug for the conference. Uh, it is happening in Granada, Spain in September, September 4th through 7th. And uh, there's still time to register. Still early bird registration available on our website at isquals.org. Um, and what was the name of the presentation, Beth? Do you remember the title? Of this presentation? Uh, I'm sorry, for the one that you're presenting. Oh, um, oh gosh, I don't know. Uh, I can't remember. Animal, uh, wildlife, something. 
I don't know, conservation and human well-being, something like that. <laughs> okay, excellent. Well, the, the sure. program will be coming out soon, so we'll know the official <laughs> title. <laughs> uh, but I, again, I'll be sending this, uh, if you would kindly, Beth, I think I, I might have this already, but send this presentation to me, and I will send okay. that. Oh, out. Mark, Mark has the title of our, of our paper. Uh, okay. Um, uh, yeah, it's using GNH to create better solutions for human well-being and wildlife conservation. Excellent. Um, Mark, if you wouldn't mind sending that to me in an email, and then Beth, if you could forward me this presentation. Yeah, Once we absolutely. Have, have the um, link for this YouTube video. We'll send it out to everyone who's registered so we can keep in good contact. And then great. if you would just keep us updated on your journal, your publications, that would be great. So yes, yes. And um, we have had um, some interest from potentially, because of this UN report on biodiversity, um, you know, there's a little more interest in Congress about this issue and potential alternative indicators and that kind of stuff. So for those of you in the US, there might be some opportunities to reach out to your member of Congress to express interest in broader well-being indicators and that kind of thing. So, you know, we'll just uh, just keep anybody who's interested and informed and wherever there's a chance to weigh in. Well, we certainly are interested, so thank you again so thank much. Thank you for having us, and thanks to everybody for, um, for coming on for the webinar. It was great to have such good participation. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you. Thank you, Beth and Mark, for your grace and for this webinar. Really appreciate it. Great. Uh, good afternoon.